In the Michigan affirmative action case decided by the Supreme Court this week, a central question was this. In a democracy, when can the majority make decisions about the rights of minorities? Justice Sonia Sotomayor, in her impassioned dissent, wrote, quote, we are fortunate to live in a democratic society, but without checks, democratically approved legislation can oppress minority groups. For that reason, our Constitution places limits on what a majority of the people may do. This case implicates one such limit, the guarantee of equal protection of the laws. Still with me is Akhil Reed Amar, professor from Yale University. Joining the table now is Hallie Potter. Policy Associate at the Century Foundation, Judith Brown Dianus, co-director of the Advancement Project, and Raul Reyes, an attorney and columnist at USA Today. Welcome all. Um, Judith, uh, and everyone can jump in on this question, actually, but Judith, I'm going to start with you. When and how is the majority allowed to limit the rights of minorities? And is that really what's happening with affirmative action in, in, in the <coughs> Michigan affirmative action? Right. Well, what's at issue in Michigan is that instead of going through the traditional process process of the Board of Trustees or Governors and the administration at the university, they set up a new rule. And the new rule went around that process, that political process, and instead set it up through a ballot initiative. And the concern is that the Equal Protection Clause protects minorities from mob rule, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, and, and it, what's really troubling about this is that this really is taking a swipe at equal protection. Um, equal protection, I mean, Justice Scalia, to actually say that the Equal Protection Clause is not about groups, but it's about individuals. Perhaps he needs to even just go watch the movie Lincoln <laughs> to understand why we have an Equal Protection Act and who it does protect. Professor Martin, what do, you, what do you think of that question? When and how is the majority allowed to limit the rights of the minority? Well, remember, the Equal Protection Clause itself was voted on. It, it came out of a political process. Um, now, Scalia and Thomas would say, all Michigan did is basically reiterate the basic idea of equal protection, no discrimination on grounds of race ever. Now, the, the court majority doesn't embrace that extreme position. The court majority, to repeat, actually says affirmative action is basically a policy question. You can have it in certain limited contexts, and basically it's up to the people of Michigan to decide that. Personally, I think Justice Breyer, you remember, he's, he's a liberal too. Mm -hmm. This one split the liberals, who said, mm -hmm. in this close question, tie goes to democracy. The people of Michigan can do it one way. The people of Connecticut can do it another way. Let's see actually what, what might work the best, but, at least constitutionally. But the problem is when race is involved, there has to be a check on it because right. of racial minorities. But, oh, oh, here's right. one final thing, though, yeah. that the majority did emphasize again and again. There was no history of past proved racial discrimination in Michigan. So what we're not dealing with here, which we were in some of these earlier cases, was remedies for proved racial violation. So those okay. other cases were limiting the ability of minorities to get remedies for intentional racial discrimination. And, and, and Kennedy says we don't have that here. Raul, you wanted to jump in. Right. Uh, to, to, I think to Judith's <coughs> point that, we, that we're talking here is that one of the court's central roles is to be the guardian and to ensure that there's fairness and justice for all people and to guard against majority rule. And we only have to look at something like Prop 8 in California. That was majority yeah rule and that that was you know ultimately overturned as unconstitutional one thing that struck me about Sonia Sotomayor's defense as you're talking about it, it was a traditional defense in the sense that it relied on precedent she went back to the idea that the court should you know, the 14th amendment uh, guarantee of equal protection for all people and then she did uh, present some of her life experience which by the way Scalia and Thomas have done in the past without in, yes. in gen, you know mm -hmm. resulting in so much criticism I mean you brought up Prop 8 which is something that came to mind when I I uh, read um, the stories on the ruling. I mean, Prop 8 was an, it was an, it was an instance when majority the, majo the majority voted to ban same-sex marriage in California, and yet last year the Supreme Court came in. They didn't rule. They ruled on standing, but. As a result, they allowed marriages to go forward and basically invalidating Prop 8. So what's the difference, what's the difference here's, here's between the difference. these two? And remember, actually, Justice Kennedy, in an earlier decision, struck down a, Cal, uh, a, Con, a Colorado ordinance mm -hmm. that discriminated against gay folks. So here's what he says is the difference. This Michigan proposition does not discriminate on grounds of race or sex or sexual but orientation, that's whereas that's Prop 8 actually did. It said straight people could get married and gay people can't. This ordinance, he says, 
doesn't say that at all. It doesn't <laughs> treat formally. Well, this is actually lawyers take this seriously. Um, it doesn't treat formally yeah, black people lawyer, differently take, from lawyers, uh, white people. Because it does treat minorities differently. It treats minorities differently because they have to go through getting a constitutional amendment to have a say in the democracy. What, what, and if you look, I mean, and if I mean, and reality is that a constitutional amendment is a very difficult thing to do. And part of the problem with what we are seeing is when the majority doesn't get its way in the legislature, we're now seeing these ballot, the ballot initiatives used where a lot of but money here, goes in here's, at the here, minority. But here's what you hang on. Hang on. Just, in this hey, case found so that there were problems right, with the ballot, ballot initiative. Hang on. Here, here's, the key point. here's what Kennedy says. Minorities themselves, ourselves, disagree even about affirmative action. So it's not the case, and it's patronizing and stereotyping, the majority argues, to assume that all minorities That's believe in affirmative action. Yeah. Hallie, jump in here. What, what, do you, what do you view take on all this? Yeah, I think ideally colleges would be able to look at race and socioeconomic status, but I think the idea that this is a policy question is interesting because it's not a settled question what's the best way to take disadvantage into account in college admissions. And if you look at other strategies, there are a lot of ways that looking at socioeconomic diversity or geographic diversity Which we're going to talk can about affect racial diversity as well. So from a pragmatic perspective, I think there's still a question, can we achieve these goals even without race explicitly being considered? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, Justice Scalia uh, in, in um, well, here's what he wrote. As Justice Harlan observed over a century ago, our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. The people of Michigan wish the same for their governing charter. It would be shameful for us to stand in their way. So do we, st given what he has said, do we still need to remedy racial discrimination in education? Oh, we absolutely do. And I don't think that socioeconomic status perfectly maps onto the same issues that you can address with race. But socioeconomic status, is particularly if it's considered in really sophisticated ways, can get at a lot of those disadvantages. And I think colleges are only beginning to tap into the possibilities mm -hmm. of that. Um, and we could be much more sophisticated in terms of really looking at not just income, but what if we also looked at families' wealth and take into factor the neighborhood poverty that is affecting people. You'll get a lot closer to taking advantage of being able to provide a leg up for disadvantaged students. Mm -hmm. we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna be talking about this, I think in the next block, but <laughs> we'll be, hold, hold the conversation. <laughs> Justice so Sotomayor is not the first to express an impassioned dissent over an affirmative action ruling. In 1978, the court ruled that colleges can consider race in admissions, but cannot use a quota system to ensure minority students get a seat.